emotional thinking. The need to contact. Emotional thinking is your enemy. I refer to it as the enemy within. As an empath, you have an addiction to the narcissist, and this addiction wants to be fed. It wants to be fed by you interacting with the narcissist, and there are a variety of different ways that that interaction can occur. Invariably, the nature of that interaction is much wider than that which people understand. And that is what, part of the reason why they fail at their no-contact regime. The addiction wants to be fed, and so it creates emotional thinking to drive you to breach your no-contact regime. Emotional thinking causes you to act in a manner which you think is appropriate and sensible when it is not. Emotional thinking wants you to interact with the narcissist so that you feed your addiction. One of the ways that it does this is to cause you to almost want a hit of the narcissist, like gaining access to a drug. But of course, the drug is actually no good for you, because with that drug comes the problems embodied in the devil's pitchfork. And if you want to understand the devil's pitchfork, listen to Halting the Hurt. This drug makes you, like any other drug, want more. It utilizes a vast array of methods to try to get you to partake in this drug. Your addiction to the narcissist must be fed. And your emotional thinking wants to con you into taking certain action so that you do feed this addiction. One way that it does this is by returning you to certain behaviours which existed when you were in the dynamic with the narcissist. The emotional thinking causes you to remember, to feel the hole that has been created when we have disengaged from you. We moved on. Your persona non grata, where we've disengaged from you, we rarely, if at all, think about you, as we are now focused on our new shiny plaything, the replacement intimate partner primary source. But for you, your addiction still wants to be fed. It wants you to interact with us. And it does so in many different ways. One of which is to cause you to feel that you need to contact the narcissist. Often it does this by corrupting your empathic trait of being a truth seeker. Because you want answers. It will also do so by corrupting your narcissistic trait of pride, by making you feel that you should still receive that which you once had. And in so doing, your emotional thinking takes you back to the time of when everything was good. It causes you to lament, to remember, to apply nostalgia to those events, to ignore the bad, and to hark for the good. And as a consequence, this emotional thinking will corrupt certain of your empathic and narcissistic traits to cause you to remember, and in so doing, to cause you to want to contact the narcissist. I now describe how this can happen, and understand that what is behind these sensations, these feelings, these thoughts, these behaviours and memories, is the conning emotional thinking. Listen to what I describe, and for many of you it will resonate, and it's important that where you think, yes, that is how I felt or how I feel, this is what I was thinking about, this is what happened to me or is happening to me, 
recognize that what is driving this behavior is your emotional thinking. And to conquer that, utilize my material to assist you in managing this addiction that you have. This describes how your emotional thinking seizes upon the need to contact the narcissist to try to get you to breach your no-contact regime. Remember when you would wake up and reach for your mobile phone and find that loving and uplifting message that I had sent you? I always rose before you and ensured that a delicious, tantalizing text was sent to you, ready for when you woke. I was asserting control over you, and to do so, to gain fuel from you. Like a morning cup of tea on your nightstand, it was that little gesture which made you feel special. It told you that the first thing I thought of when I woke up was you, whereas in reality, what I was truly thinking of was asserting control over you and then gaining fuel. This message of love, desire, passion and excitement would provide you with the first buzz of the day, a delicious reminder of how wonderful I am and how wonderful and marvellous we are together. The first text of the inevitable deluge that would follow throughout the day. Scores of little gift-wrapped presents which you open and smile, laugh and melt over. Little did you realise that these messages had been recycled from your predecessor and would be used again for your replacement. Little did you also realise that two other people were receiving these messages first thing in the morning. Now, there is nothing. There is no chime of that early morning text. There is no winking light denoting the text waiting for you to open it. It is silence. As your eyes open, the conditioning that I caused makes you immediately remember how you used to feel when that text arrived. Where once you woke with excitement in your stomach, now it is just the sharp stab of pain as you know there is nothing waiting for you. You understand this is how it should be, the need to stay away from me, but it hurts. It hurts so much, and how long will this pain remain with you? Will it ever go away? Those months of daily morning texts has ingrained a pattern and a longing inside you. And no matter how hard you try, the first thought of your day is always, four months ago, he was still sending me these wonderful texts. Last month, it was the same sentence, only began with three months. You roll onto your back, and though you know you shouldn't, you cannot help but allow me into your mind even further, as you recall those mornings where we ended up late for work because of our passionate lovemaking. That quick dart to the ensuite and then back into bed where I was waiting for you. You turn and look at the empty pillow, and that all too familiar bittersweet sensation sweeps across you. You know you should not do this. You know you ought now to seek refuge amongst the ghosts of what once was. But it makes the pain lessen. You know you shouldn't do it, but you do so just for a while. It is just a memory, isn't it? Thinking about me just the one time can't do any harm, surely. But it does. It reinforces and increases your emotional thinking. And it makes it all the harder for you to move forward. Just the one time. You give a twisted smile at that sentence, which has somehow become your daily mantra, as you struggle to escape the toxins that I have left inside of you, the legacy of my so oh-so-effective seduction and poisoning of you. Your emotional thinking seizes upon all of the ever-presence that I created. Just the one time you check on my tweets and who is following me and who I am following. Just the one time you park near where I lived. And watched, slumped in your driver's seat, to see who might appear at my door. Just the one time you sent a friend to watch me at an event you knew I would be attending. 
and to report back on what she saw. Just the one time you reread the emails I sent you. It was just the one time for them all and more. Well, one time a week, then one time a day. But I don't know what you are doing, do I? So where is the harm? Just the one time you returned to my Facebook profile, scouring it, looking for clues like some desperate detective intent on tracking down the prolific killer. You look at what I have liked, a picture here, a comment there, some meme about relationships, which could be a digger to you, but you're not sure. Any trace of you, of course, has been erased from my profile. I'm with somebody else now, you no longer matter. Gone are the messages, the comments and the pictures. Somebody else is there now. Although there is some ambiguity. A red-headed, picture, a red-headed woman appears in several pictures laughing with me. You see one where her arms are draped around my shoulders. And you feel the burning jealousy and anger and curse both you and I for this feeling. Your emotional thinking seizes upon these narcissistic traits to cause you to want to contact me, to berate me. But you resist, for now. You fling your tablet to one side, muttering under your breath, just the one look, having derailed your day before it has begun, and you vow not to look again. But you will. Just one look. A journey through the carousel of pictures, checking fingers to see if rings have appeared on them of both me It would be awful to see that ring on my wedding finger, something that I always denied to you, and of the women I pose with. It makes you feel sort of better if they wear a ring. That means that they won't be with me. Or does it? You skulk amongst my Twitter posts, and return to my profile on my work website, reading the biography which you know off by heart. Your fingers rest on my profile picture as you see again the tie which you bought for me for that particular photo shoot. Some days you wish that it would be updated, and then other days this once luck makes you feel that perhaps I do not hate you. How can I, if I still allow this picture to remain? The reality is, I have not looked at my own picture on that profile, why would I? I have forgotten that it is the tie that you bought me, and it is nothing to signal that I once... Now think favourably of you again. You try not to think about me, but somehow your mind just wanders there, of its own volition, snaking through a thousand memories that spring up each day. Perhaps you will stay a while amidst them, just the once, just the one minute of remembering. At the weekend you drove out to the forest path we used to amble along during sunny September mornings. Nobody else was ever there, just you and I. You walked that path again. It was just the one time that you needed to do it, to converse with the ghost of my presence as you found yourself talking aloud to me, as if I was still walking beside you, holding your hand. It was meant to be just the one time, yet you have returned three times since, each time swearing that this time is when you exercise those spectres. Of course, this is your emotional thinking, driving you to return again and again, saying, sure, this will be the last time, absolutely the last time. Except it isn't. Because each time that you give in to these breaches of your no contact, you increase your emotional thinking. So it will make you do it again and again. Just like the drug addict saying, one more line, and then another one, and then another one. What am I doing now? No doubt getting ready for work, perhaps showering and singing away as I once did in the shower that we shared together. Am I with somebody? Is somebody preparing breakfast for me, or reclining in bed waiting for me to return to the bedroom, towel draped about me? It seems so long since you have heard from me, and so much remains unanswered, unsaid and unresolved. How would I react if you rang me? You cannot bring yourself to delete my number, just in case there was that one final conversation which could take place, and put so many issues to bed, slay so many demons, and close so many doors. That would be all it would take, surely. Just one conversation. Keep it businesslike. Keep your emotions in check, but just to get some answers so you can move on. Surely that is owed to you. 
Again, the emotional thinking cons you into considering such matters and allowing you to dwell on them. You wonder whether I would answer if you rang me. How would I react if I saw your number on the display? You doubt I have blocked you. Why would I do that? Your fingers toy with your phone. You need to know, just the once, just to make the hurt go away. You find my name. You want to hear my voice again, talk and no more, but you feel anxious and the trepidation crawls over you. You need to know. You need the answers. What about ringing me, and then stopping before I answer to see if I call back? Yes, that's a good idea. That would then show that I do want to talk to you, without the fear of ha having me hang up on you. And that's it. You will telephone me again after these months of nothing and let it ring, and then this ever-present agony can be eased. The questions can be answered when I call you back. Again, your emotional thinking is conning you into breaching your no-contact regime. You won't melt into my arms again, no, you're going to resist my sweet charms, because now you know what lies behind them. You've earned your stripes in that regard, but you need to have this conversation for yourself. You need to know I will talk to you. A text message isn't immediate enough. I might not see it for some time, or I might delay in replying. But a missed call that brings a potential for urgency and immediacy, and I am bound to respond to that, aren't I? You will call me. You will call and let it ring. Just the one time.